Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Tuesday night. I want to start with prayer, and then when I'm done praying, we're going to be in Ephesians 2. So you can flip there now or when I'm done praying, <laughs> depending on how fast you are. <laughs> it's like one of those old sword drills. Anyone ever do those when they were kids where you had to quickly flip open to scripture? Okay, time's up. <laughs> Father, we thank you so much for this evening. I thank you for each and every woman that is here. I just pray that you would speak to our hearts tonight, Lord, about being useful to the master. We thank you for the price that you paid to purchase us. God, I pray that you would convict us as necessary, that you give encouragement to somebody who is maybe hesitant to serve, and that you would use this night ultimately to be to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Ephesians 2.10. We're going to start out with what is probably a very familiar verse if you've been in church any amount of time. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Tonight is called being useful to the master. So we're studying through some of the characteristics of what it means to be a godly woman. And that's the title for tonight, useful to the master. So Ephesians 2.10 says this. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. We talked a couple of weeks ago that we were made in God's image, wrought or fashioned, specifically made by him. And part of the reason that this verse tells us that we were made was for good works. And it also tells us that he prepared works for each of us to do beforehand. So that means that each one of us, if we know Christ, has a list of works that he's prepared for us to walk in. Just because he's prepared them for us doesn't necessarily mean that we will be obedient to fulfill them, but he has them for us. That should be part of what we are intending to do as we walk on earth, trying to live out the purpose of fulfilling the calling that we've received and walking in the works that he's called us to. If you feel, you know, a lot of times the world will tell you that you should just live for yourself, do what you want, do what makes you happy, more for you, and that is a very empty focus. You'll find yourself very unhappy. You'll find yourself wondering if there is more to life because the answer is yes, there is more to life. You're not created for the purpose of living for yourself and heaping up more things and being self-centered. You're actually created for the purpose of doing good works for other people, for the service of the king. That's part of our created purpose. And you will feel a lack if you're not fulfilling the purpose that God created you to do. You will feel bored. You will feel empty. You will feel frustrated and even depressed. And you will wonder, is there more? And yes, there is. This is part of what we're created for. This is not salvation. Some people will try to tell you that you do works and that earns your salvation, that the more good works that we do, those outweigh our bad works and those gain us entry into heaven. That's not how it works. If you look in verse 8, it says this very specifically, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God specifically says, he very deliberately says, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. If there was anything that we could do to earn our way into heaven, then it would be a work. Then salvation would be based on us. It wouldn't be a gift of grace. Paul very specifically tells us this is not our salvation, but it is evidence of our salvation. When we walk in the good works that God has prepared for us ahead of time, it is evidence of the fact that we have been redeemed that we have been purchased, that we have a new master. It is evidence of the fact that we're living a life that is surrendered, not to our will, but to his will, and a heart that is devoted in worship to the king. A person like that can't help but do good works. It comes out of the overflow of a heart that is thankful, that is worshipful, that is dedicated to the Lord. So if you go back a few books toward the back, we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 2. So the thing about doing good works, we're all called to them, but these verses indicate to us that there are some prerequisites, if you will, to being useful to the master. We want to be useful to the master, but it's, that's not automatic. We have a part to play in that. 2 Timothy 2.20 says this, Now in a large house there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and some to honor, and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. 
This tells us that there are two different kinds of vessels. There are some that are for honor and some that are for dishonor. I was reading a commentary, and you might read that initially and think that speaks of someone who's saved and someone who's not saved, but this person was saying this actually speaks of believers, that even though we are saved, we still are either vessels for honor or vessels for dishonor, depending on how we live our lives. We have the choice there. What kind of a vessel will we be? And a vessel is meant to be filled to be filled with something. And I love the fact that he uses the word vessel because really, in and of ourselves, we're just empty vessels. We're not capable of anything. We don't have power to do things. We don't give ourselves gifts. We don't give ourselves talents. We don't give ourselves ability. We are empty vessels apart from Christ. But that vessel is meant to be filled. It is meant to be useful. And it says here, if anyone cleanses himself, that indicates that any one of us can be a vessel for honor. That's not just for special people or people with specific talents or specific gifts. Anyone can be a vessel for honor, but it says we have to cleanse ourselves from these things. And it gives us a list in verse 22 of things to cleanse ourselves from. This is a prerequisite to being useful to the master. And the problem is that a lot of us have the desire to be useful to the master, but we fail the very first test of keeping our lives clean. So we disqualify ourselves from being useful. We claim that we want people to know the Lord, we want to share the gospel, we want to see lives changed, but we're living with our boyfriend, or we're watching things that we shouldn't be watching, or we're participating in gossip, or we're harboring unforgiveness or bitterness, and these things disqualify us from usefulness to the master. It's a hindrance. You might still be able to be used in small ways, but in some of those bigger areas where God wants to entrust you, because your life is not clean, we disqualify ourselves. Cleansing ourselves is a prerequisite. It says that we should flee from youthful lust. That means that we seek safety by flight. It doesn't mean that we play around with sin or we look a little bit longer to see if maybe it's not as bad as we think it is or we try to figure out how close we can get to the edge. It says that we run away because we recognize that it is dangerous to our spiritual lives to loiter there. Like Eve, when she lingered too long in the garden and she looked at the fruit and she began to see that that was pleasant and it seemed good to her and she wanted to eat, The Bible says, don't stay there. Don't look too long. It says, get out of there. Flee. Run away from those things. Avoid it. Run swiftly. This is not a slow, meandering walking away. It is you run in the opposite direction as fast and as hard as you away from away from sin as you can. Because if we're going to serve the Lord, we have to be pure of heart. We talked about that last week. Purity of heart. We have to run away. We have to flee from these lusts. And it says that we will be sanctified. And that means set apart. Now at salvation, we are sanctified by the Lord. We are set apart. We are declared holy. But it is up to us to participate from that point on in that sanctification process. In continuing to be set apart. and continuing to be different. And not just to be set apart from sin. But also, the other part of sanctification is that we are then dedicated to the Lord. And a lot of us are more dedicated to ourselves than we are to the Lord, to our own interests, our own time, our own hobbies, usefulness that advances our own ambitions. But the Bible says that if we're going to be faithful and useful, we must be separate from things that are unclean and also dedicated to the Lord and his service. I think about it like this. In my laundry room, I have this bucket that used to have honey. It was like a gallon of honey or something. And I use that bucket to clean stuff up. So if the dog vomits or I need to clean the car or I need to wipe something off a carpet, you know, I'll go get that bucket. I'll fill it up with some kind of cleaner solution. And I use that bucket for gross jobs. Okay. What I don't do though, is take that bucket to the dinner table and serve pasta out of it. Cause that would be gross. <laughs> right? You don't mix those vessels. You, you keep them apart. I, I have one vessel for cleaning, and I have a pasta dish that stays in my kitchen and gets washed clean after every serving. They're separate. They're different. And that's what the Bible is talking about. We are called to be vessels used for honor, not for dishonor. But a lot of times we're playing around with dishonorable things, and we become dishonorable vessels that the Lord wants to use for honorable purposes. But we're disqualified because we're not clean, we're not godly, we're not ready. We're supposed to keep our vessel sanctified, set apart, dedicated just to the service of the Lord. We're supposed to purify our soul. 
Renew it in time with the Lord, in scripture, in study, in prayer, in time with other believers. Knowing that we are set apart. The Bible says we are a chosen race. We are distinctive. We're meant to be distinctive. Dedicated to the Lord. And it says when we are that, we will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, and prepared for every good work. Doing these things prepares us for the works that God has for us. That is us making the necessary preparations to get everything ready for his usefulness. God empowers us. God gives us the gifts. God gives us the talents. He gives us the strength and the grace and all of those things. But we have a hand in that preparation. We have a hand in making sure that our lives are clean and ready and prepared for the good works that he's called us to. We are prepped by the Holy Spirit. We're given everything that we need by him, but we have to submit our will to his to obey. We need to use the talents that we already have for his glory, separated and set apart for him. And there should be a willingness there, an eagerness to serve, a readiness. I think we forget that sometimes. We live in a culture that's very much about me, about my platform, my face, my money, my stuff, my material possessions, my power, my influence. And the Bible says it's not about any of that stuff. Instead of serving ourselves, we should be dedicated to the Lord, and that makes us useful. That makes us easy to use. So when the Lord needs somebody to use, we're ready because we've been clean, we set ourselves apart, we're dedicated to him, and we're prepared. And we are easy for him to use. Go with me to Acts 9. This is not based on feelings, This is based on deliberate decisions that we make that make us prepared to be useful to the master. And I'm going to tell you what, most of the time, if I went on feelings, I probably wouldn't obey the Lord because it's generally not the easy choice. It's always the blessed choice, but it's often not the easy choice. And sometimes, often, it means that you're walking alone because a lot of people aren't going to go with you. And you have to be okay with that because our service is to the Lord. Our usefulness is to the Lord. That's the one that we're serving. I love the story in Acts 9. This is about a lady named Tabitha. And it it gives us this great illustration of a woman whose life was useful to the Lord. So we're going to look at usefulness through her life in Acts 9, verse 36. It says, Now in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dorcas. This woman was abounding with good deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. And it happened at that time that she fell sick and died, and when they had washed her body, they laid it in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, imploring him, do not delay in coming with us. So Peter arose and went with them. When he arrived, they brought him into the upper room, and all the windows stood beside him, or all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. But Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when Peter saw, or when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and raised her up, and calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. It became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed many days in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. So we have this really cool story of this lady named Tabitha, or Dorcas is her name in Greek. And she is called a disciple. She's called a follower of Christ. She knows him. She follows him. She serves him. And that is evidence of a changed heart. And that is the source of her charity. That's the source of her good deeds and her kindness. That has to be the beginning of our usefulness to the master. That has to be the beginning of the motivation for us to even do good works. Because we have a changed life and a changed heart. Because we're grateful for the saving grace of Christ. If we do good without Christ, it's just empty. If you remember, Jesus said, anyone who gives even a cup of cold water in my name, that's important. Even something as small as a cup of water that's given in the name of Christ has value, has meaning, has importance. She's doing this in the name of Christ. She is a disciple, and it says that she is abounding. That means she's filled up in every part. That would be like every single surface being covered with good works, Any open space that she has, she's doing good works. Any moment, every part, she's thoroughly permeated. It's as though there is a hollow vessel, which we are, we talked about us being vessels, and that's filled up to the very tippy top. That's Tabitha's life. 
She's abounding in good deeds and charity and kindness, which she continually does. And we're called to be like Tabitha, to be abounding in good deeds, to be abounding in kind acts. When you read through scripture and it talks about all the different things about doing good deeds or good works, these are some of the things that it says. It says that we should be rich in good works. We should be prepared for good works. Our lives should have a pattern of good works. We should be zealous for them. We should be careful to maintain them. We should be perfect in them. And we should provoke one another to good works. If you think about your life, does that list describe your life? Are you rich in good works? Are you careful to maintain them? Is it even something that you think about? Are you zealous for them? Are you looking for space and time and ways that God might be opening doors for you to complete good works? Are you provoking other people to good works? Encouraging them to use the giftings that God has given them? Some of us like to talk about good works. Sometimes people like to suggest good works to me. And I like to say, I have my good works. (laughs) Maybe God's asking you to do that one. (laughs) (laughs) we don't want to just talk about doing good things we want to actually actively engage in them like Tabitha did we want to complete that you know Dwight Moody someone uh, commented one time I love this quote about his method of evangelism and he said I like my way better than your not way of doing it (laughs) and that can be true of our good works right like like we can talk about a lot of things but do we actually have them do we have anything in our life that we can point to that say, this is where I serve the Lord, this is how I serve him, these are the good works that I maintain, these are the ones that I'm zealous for. That should be an, a significant part of our life if we are disciples of Jesus Christ. And I love this story because Tabitha just used what she had. This girl is in the Bible because she had a needle and thread. I mean, that's pretty incredible. A lot of times we think we have to be some eloquent speaker or some gifted leader or do some magnificent, I don't know, discernment tactic or something. And it's not really about that. It's just about using what we have. She sewed her way into scripture. Think about that for a minute. And someone would probably think, you know, needle and thread, big deal. Who cares? I have this. What could that possibly do for the kingdom? But she didn't ask that question. She just got busy sewing. And she made tunics and garments for these widows who were likely very poor because their source of income, their stability, their husbands had passed away. And so she just saw a need and she got busy filling it. And the Bible gives her several verses, not just one. Oh, there was a woman here who did a bunch of good stuff. She has an entire dedicated passage of scripture to the good deeds that she did because she sewed stuff. What is in your hand? What's in your life? What can you give? What can you offer? It might seem like it's a small thing. I've had people say to me, gosh, it seems like such just a small thing. Give it anyways. What if that little boy, when Jesus was calling for someone, he told his disciples, you know, you guys go feed this multitude of people. And they're saying, like, we really don't have the capacity to do that. And one of them suggests, like, probably embarrassing, like, there's this little boy that has some loaves and some fish, but, you know, it's not really enough for all these people. But it didn't matter. The beginning product didn't matter because Jesus was able to multiply it to make it enough. Your little tiny bit, even if it seems so small and insignificant, give it anyway because when the Lord infuses it with his power, he makes it enough. And it's incredible to watch the church be the church and when everybody gives a little bit, it adds up to the mountain that is necessary to meet a gigantic need. Don't be afraid to give your little bit because it seems small and insignificant. Give it anyways. Every part is necessary. Many years ago, Wes had a truck that stopped working. I don't know a lot about cars. Like if it's not the battery, I pretty much can't help you. (laughs) Like, I don't know, is the battery dead? (laughs) You know, I know it has like pistons and a transmission and brake pads and some import oil. I get my oil changed, right? But it stopped working, and so we were just sure that the whole engine had blown, and we were going to need a new transmission for a bunch of money, $1,200. We finally, we were, you know, we were like, I don't know if we can really afford another car, and all the things. He finally took it to a mechanic, and you know what was wrong with it? It was a loose wire. <laughs> just a loose wire. But it was significant enough that it caused the entire engine to malfunction and not turn over and not run. It prevented the entire machine from going forward. And I think about that, something like that, when I think about the church. We're all just one little piece. 
a wire, a brake pad, oil, gas, whatever you want to say. But if it's not working together, then the whole machine breaks down. And sometimes we can feel like it's just such an insignificant, small little part that my part doesn't matter, someone else will cover it, and the reality is no one else is going to get it. The good works that you're called to are the good works that you're called to, and nobody else is going to do that for you. Those are the ones that God has for you to walk in, and if you don't do it, then nobody does it. There isn't someone standing behind you that's just going to say, it's cool, I got it. You have good works that God has called you to do, and it's important that you do them or the entire machine breaks down. The entire machine is less effective. Even if you think your part is really small, it still matters to the whole because we are one living, breathing body, and God has created it to function together perfectly, beautifully, with all the varied giftings and the varied ways, and your part matters. She was likely very unaware of her impact. She just sewed some tunics. How could she possibly have known the impact that her death would have? And yet it was so incredibly impactful that when she died, it created such a ruckus that they went and got Peter from the neighboring town, and they were like, you got to come over here and help us with this lady. What a massive impact her life had. Sometimes we can get discouraged because we feel like our little bit doesn't matter or our corner of the world isn't recognized or nobody cares or we're doing things and it doesn't seem to have an impact on the kingdom. Not like that person over there. We begin to compare ourselves to somebody else. And that is a tactic of Satan to discourage us and to keep us from serving. Your part does matter. Sometimes I think the Lord shields us from our own impact for our own good because we are so prone to arrogance. We're so prone to begin to look at our good deeds and take them for ourselves. And so sometimes I think he just shields our eyes from the impact. But we can begin to think because we don't see a long line of change or a long line of accomplishments or a long line of things that our lives don't have an impact. And that is a Satan's lie. Your part matters. When she dies, when Tabitha dies... Peter is summoned to raise her back from the dead. And the Bible says that many believed because of this whole life and this whole testimony. Her sowing was what brought many to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It seems such a simple thing, doesn't it? What can you give? What can you dedicate? What do you have? It might be a little bit, but in the hands of the Savior, it becomes mighty. And often as we give that little bit, he'll entrust you with more because you've proven that you are faithful in that small thing. And then he'll entrust you with a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more because he knows that you are a vessel of honor that's sanctified, useful to the master, and who is prepared for every good work. But the thing about being useful to the master is that he gets to define our usefulness. A lot of times we want to do that. We have jobs all picked out for ourselves that we think we'd be pretty good at. And then when people don't call us for those particular jobs, then we get upset. But our usefulness is to the Lord. He gets to define the extent of it. We might think we're here to serve every day of the week, and he might say, you know what, I just want you to serve one time a month. Or vice versa. Maybe you're like, once a month is good. And he's like, "Mm, try every Sunday. (laughs) Promise you there's room for you. (laughs) You know, there have been times in my life where usefulness to the master meant that I took a back seat. When I was having my third, fourth, and fifth kids, I was basically out of every kind of ministry. And that was hard. Because I love the church. I love serving in the church. I love watching the Lord work, whether it's through me or somebody else. You know, I liken it to the burning bush. that I just want to be up close and, and watch it burn. I don't even have to be the one that lit it on fire. Like, God can do it through somebody else, but I just like to see it happen because I love to behold the power of God. But there was a season in my life where I really had to take a back seat, and he was asking me. I knew it. He was like, you need to be dedicated here to your home and your children, and you need to be happy doing it. Great. Cool. Then, as my kids got a little bit older, then he was like, okay, now I have some work for you to do. And then he was like, you know, and that involves the stage. And I was like, cool, I think home was easier. (laughs) Yikes. But he gets to determine the extent of that. And my obedience to him means that I follow where he calls, whether that is a closet in my home or a toilet that I'm cleaning or the dishes or here teaching or 
I don't know, walking some foreign mission field, praying for somebody. He determines the extent of my ministry. He determines the extent of our usefulness. I don't get to assign that. We we don't get to pick out people like I would like to. You know what I want to be? I just want to be the close counselor of the pastor, you know? I just want to pick that one girl, and I think I should mentor that one particular person. Or I'm going to serve only in this one way. We don't get to define that. He defines our usefulness because it is usefulness to the master. And he defines our time frame too. You notice that Tabitha was faithful all the way until death. And I bet when she was raised again, she was probably faithful for many years until she passed away a second time. (laughs) This is a lifelong call, girls. This is not something that we just step into and then step out of or retire from. We don't retire as disciples. This is a lifestyle. This is a every living, breathing moment that if we are his, we are stewards of everything that he has given us. We, we are his stewards. This is his time. Every day that he gives me is a day that he has given me. The breath in my lungs, the talents that I have, the money, the energy, my thoughts, all of it, all of it belongs to him. So it's up to me to be a good steward of that and to serve to the extent that he wants me to serve, and literally until the day that I die. If you have breath in your lungs, there's stuff for you to do, I promise. He still has good works for you to walk in. We don't quit. You know, a lot of times we have a lot of reasons that we want to quit. I've paid my dues. I did that. Let somebody else do it. I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm too busy. Listen, girls, I'm, I'm busy. I hear you. We have all kinds of excuses for why we don't want to serve but none of those are valid. It doesn't say in that Ephesians 2 passage that he has good works for us prepared beforehand for us to walk in, except if you have a good excuse. It doesn't say that. I don't find the exception there. He just says, I got stuff for you to do. Get busy. And we're supposed to be useful for that. We're supposed to do all that he asks us, that everything that we are, every moment, every resource is at his disposal. That is a surrendered heart. My day is yours. My time is yours. And I'm going to tell you, girls, that is hard. That really irks at the Martha in me because I have a very specific and important checklist for every single day that needs to get done in order for my life to run smoothly, okay? I got kids that have to be places. People need to eat. I got lots of things to do. But that requires, if I am going to be useful to the master, that he's allowed to interrupt that that he's allowed to delay me because somebody needs to be prayed for, that he's allowed to ask me, you know what, you need to double that and take a meal to somebody because they're having a hard time. Or you know what, you need to sacrifice some of your money, get a gift card and send it to them because they're really going through a trial. Okay, all that I am is yours. My car is yours if someone wants to borrow it, go ahead. My house is yours if someone wants to use it, they can use it. My stuff is yours. I'm yours, my time, all those things are at his disposal. What do you withhold? We withhold sometimes things because we're not comfortable. Let me tell you, if I only did the things I was, com- I was yeah, comfortable with, I'd still be sitting on my couch. <laughs> Our comfort zone has nothing to do with it. In a minute, we're going to be in Luke 17. It's not about what you're comfortable with. You think Moses was comfortable returning to the land where he was a murderer to talk to Pharaoh and say, hey, let the slaves go? Was Daniel comfortable in the lion's den? Probably not. Mary, comfortable? Yeah, I'll carry the Messiah I'll let everybody know that I'm pregnant but not married. That's not super comfortable. It has nothing to do with your comfort zone. We serve the master who we just obey. He gets to define what the extent of our service is, what our time frame is, what the tasks are that he calls us to because we are his. I love this verse in Luke 17 because it really keeps us in our place. He's talking to the disciples. He's giving them an example of a slave that has been given some tasks. And in verse 9, it talks about the master. It says this, He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded, you say, We are unworthy slaves. We have only done that which we ought to have done. That is what we are. We were slaves to sin that were purchased by God with his blood, and now the Bible says that we become slaves of righteousness. And this says, yeah, we were unworthy slaves. We were wretched sinners that he saw fit to die for and redeem. And he has given us things that he's commanded for us to do. And we should do 
what we ought to do. That's a duty that we owe back to the Lord. That is a debt that is repaid. It doesn't make us more righteous. It doesn't make us more spiritual. It doesn't mean our salvation. But it is a debt that we owe to the master out of a heart of gratitude for all that he has done for us. Because it's not about you. Go to Matthew 5 and I'm going to be done. This life is not about you. It's not about me. Sometimes I wish it was. It would make things easier for my little mind. But it's not. It's about him. Matthew 5, 16 says this. This is the purpose of all of the good works that we do. All the things that we walk in. Matthew 5, 16 says this. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That is the end goal of our usefulness. That is why we do any service at all, is to glorify him. It's not to add cool titles to our identity. It's not to make ourselves more righteous. It's not so we can be spiritually arrogant. It's not so we can be puffed up with how important and great we are and have a little spiritual kingdom that we rule over. The point of it is that we let our light shine That people do, in fact, see the good works that we do, but they look past us to the Father and they glorify him. Everything that we do should point to the Lord. What we want is for people, through our good works, to become acquainted with the Lord. To understand who he is better because they have interacted with us. Otherwise, we're doing all this before men. And the Bible actually warns of that. It says, beware that you don't do your righteousness before men because otherwise you're like the Pharisees. You just do it to be seen. It's not for the Lord at all. It's for yourself. What we want is to glorify God. We want to reveal him to those around us. And part of how we do that is by being useful to the master and walking in the good works that he's called us to. Many believe because of Tabitha's faith, because of her service, because of her good works. She gained notoriety for sowing. Why? Because she took that little task and she dedicated it to the Lord and she used it for his service. And that is the goal because a truly transformed life can't help but attract people to the Savior. It just does. It's inevitable. It will. It will make people turn aside. They will see the light in you. They will see the good works. And the goal then is that we turn them to glorify the Lord. They'll see the church in action and they want to know why. And how? Why would you sacrifice your time with your family to do that for those people that you hardly know? What's the motivation for that? I don't understand. Why do you love people like that? Why do you forgive people like that? Why do you keep your life separate? What is the point? And we have the opportunity then to point them to Christ, to be the hands and feet of Jesus that are revealing his salvation and his redemption. The motivation for being useful to the master is that everything points to him. But in order for that to happen, we have to surrender our lives. We have to purify ourselves. We have to live lives that are separate and that are prepared to be useful to the master so that we can proclaim him to the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your saving grace. That though we were unworthy slaves of sin, that you saw fit to come down, shed your blood, and redeem us. Father, I pray that you would work in our hearts the desire to serve you with every single day, in big ways and small ways, whether it's a cup of cold water, a meal made, a child watched and cared for, Scripture shared, a prayer. God, that it would be our heart's desire in everything that we do, in every place that we go, to be useful to the Master, to be prepared for every single good work that you would call us to. Bless our time this evening, Lord, and may our lives truly glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen.